Welcome to Performance Analytics Academy. Um, my name is Thomas Davis and I am your host. Uh, for those of you that are new, welcome. For those of you that have been here before, welcome to you as well. Um, we have some really good uh, information to share today, like every other session that we do. But this one is um, very interesting because it's going to be talking about the new things that are in Rome that just released. So um, a lot of good information uh, that will come out of this today. A couple of logistical things that we can get to real quickly so we can get directly into it. Uh, this is for you. We do these sessions for you. We try to make sure that we're providing content that is um, relevant to everyday needs and, and things that are done inside of the platform as it's related to performance analytics and reporting. So, um, you know, make sure that you, uh, you know, you try to get everything that you can out of this. And if there's uh, sessions that you would like us to do in the future, uh, definitely let us know that in the community as well. A uh, big thing, this is being recorded uh, for you so you can access it later on uh, YouTube and also in the community. But if recording is an issue with your organization, you may want to go ahead and drop now. But uh, again, it is being recorded and it'll actually be out um, in those destinations later on uh, today. We do have a question and answer. We have an, a question and answer window that is part of Zoom here. So if you have any questions while the presentation is going on, uh, feel free to ask those questions. We do have uh, people on the call that will uh, hopefully be able to answer those while the presentation is still going. If it is a question that cannot be answered until after or it needs to be live, we'll do that during the uh, Q&A section of the presentation. Uh, we will always answer the questions that are related to the content that's being covered first. And if time uh, permits, we'll get to any other questions that are out there. If we're not able to get to uh, the questions that are outstanding, then please feel free to ask those in the community. And only not only will ServiceNow uh, personnel look at that, but also other great gurus that are out there using, the, using ServiceNow anyway. So uh, today, Patty is going to be presenting for us. Uh, again, a lot of good information. I look forward to it as well. Uh, and again, I'm Thomas Davis. You all know me. So with that, uh, I'm quickly going to pass it over to Patty because I know that she has a lot that she wants to cover today. So Patty, whenever you're ready to grab Sharon, go for it. Hi, everyone. I'm Patty Montesinos. I'm a platform outbound staff product manager at ServiceNow. And today I'm going to go over what's new, what's changed in our Roam release, specifically related to our PA and reporting out-of-the-box solutions. I'm first going to start off, we have a number of updates and new content in Rome across our different apps, but I'll first start off with our workforce optimization. Um, and this is our work, this is our workspace out of the box solution. Um, this is available for both ITSM and CSM. And so this is the reason why I wanted to start off with both of them because um, we made enhancements to both for the CSM and ITSM uh, application. We've updated it with adding shift scheduling forecasts configuration and coaching. Um, and for ITSM, we also enhance the team uh, landing page for it. I'll go into further detail with each one of them, but first I wanted to kind of give an overview for those that are not familiar with what our workforce optimization application does uh, or what it specifically is. It manages and maintains the productivity of our workforce from a single location. So from our classic, on our classic platform, um, you're used to accessing our dashboards um, or and having to go to different places in order to access uh, whether it was the app itself and then go to the dashboard. Um, here now in our workforce in our work uh, workspace um, app, our new environment, um, we have a central location where you can access everything that you need in one place. Um, so it's really uh, it's a great experience in terms of being able to access um, these different applications in, in, in one location. Uh, the three uh, features, like I mentioned, are available both for CSM and ITSM, and then Teams was just the, uh, we enhanced that one only for ITSM. So what shift planning is, I'll start off first with that one. Um, it's a, it gives you the ability to create schedule adherence plans and, visual, and visualizations that will help you track whether your team members are adhering to, the, to their schedules. So if you have the shift planning admin role, which would be uh, available for the manager, you can add on-call shifts for the, from the shift tab, which is uh, located here. Um, and you can add uh, a work shift for uh, any of your team members and be able to view it within this calendar. So you can see when they're checking in, when they're checking out, if they're hitting, adhering and hitting um, their allotted time slots of, of their work 
of their uh, work schedule. You can also view, uh, um, not just see like one of your agents, but literally see all the members in within your sp specific assignment group, what their schedules are, and if they're, uh, or anybody that's uh, directly or additionally being managed by, uh, you're managing. You're also able to swap shifts between agents and skip the approval process. And then you can filter by uh, the different assignment groups from the calendar view, uh, just to make sure you have the proper agent coverage and the demand for every hour of the day or, or every week. Um, as a planning, a shift planning agent, so this would be more for like the CSM agent or the IT agent, uh, they can request time off on call or, uh, or during the work shift, or they can uh, be able to you know, swap it with another uh, team member to cover their shift. Um, Within the SIF uh, schedule, you can see that there's uh, different tabs here. I'm going to go through the forecasting and the schedule adherence. Uh, the schedule adherence, we're able to also be able to track success metrics. Um, and these are the KPIs, uh, adherence and conformance, um, that allow you to be able to understand uh, how you're performing in terms of scheduling. So adherence is, being, is a metric that helps you analyze how close your agents are following their schedule and completing their work assignments. So basically we're measuring this by minutes worked in that shift divided by uh, the schedule shift uh, plus any overtime that that agent uh, had. Uh, whereas conformance, um, it measures the work completed regardless of when it was completed. So the minutes worked in that shift plus any overtime divided by that schedule shift in minutes. Um, so having a high adherence rate will indicate that the agents are sticking to their schedules and offering customer service uh, when expected. Whereas if they have a low adherence, that would suggest that uh, we need to make some changes in the processes or decisions to be able to manage the team more efficiently. Uh, schedule adherence and uh, conformance ha do have some thresholds by default um, in our out of the box. Uh, for adherence, um, anything above a 70 is, is, is an ideal adherence to have. And then for conformance, it would be between 80 and 120. Um, however, your admin's able to ch change those, uh, be able to configure those thresholds um, to whatever makes sense for your organization. Uh, the manager has the ability to view the schedule adherence and conformance by the team and by uh, the agent. So uh, from this view, uh, as a manager, I can drill into, let's say, the adherence of tech support. And I will get this view. I'll be able to trend it over time and see how uh, historically and if we're doing better in terms of our schedule adherence. Um, and as well as can I can scroll down and get the view of what that schedule adherence is and conformance is for each of those uh, agents within um, that assignment group. So in, in this case, tech support. And then I also get the experience of being able to drill in further if I just wanna look at the performance of, of a specific agent. So in this case, let's say we click at Blair's uh, to see what Blair's um, schedule adherence is over time. Uh, I get the same experience as I did at the team level. Um, and the same goes for if we do, if we were to repeat the same experience for conformance. You have the ability to filter uh, by any uh, given time period and the timeline will adjust to that specific uh, time period that you're interested in. The next uh, update that we made was that we uh, is our demand forecast or also known as our agent forecast. So there's different um, metrics that you can forecast out from within the workspace. Um, in this case here, we have chat interactions created. And what the forecasting does is it's allowing you to really uh, forecast and analyze your workforce demand. So how many agents are required to take up the work assignments? Um, as of Rome, the forecast admin can configure and tweak the forecasting parameters to see how the work forecast behaves, and they can adjust the forecast manually to fine tune them for a greater accuracy. So within the workspace, um, they're able to change the parameters like of like how far, how the length of period that we want to use in the model of forecasting out and how far we, what, how many periods we want to forecast, whether it's four days or four weeks, um, et cetera. You're also able to tweak like which algorithm. Um, by default, it will be set to auto, so we'll pick the best algorithm the, um, in terms of the results of the outcome. But you can tweak that if there's a specific algorithm that you're wanting. Um, 
and then you are able to publish it uh, directly here. And so after you publish it, you, you get the results of what that forecast looks like. Uh, one thing to know is that the demand forecast um, application uses metric base to forecast the demands for the teams and uses historical data from multiple channels. So you can configure it and pick any table that you want, uh, depending on the metric that you're wanting to use. Um, you can also do, we did the configuration I first showed you within the workspace, but you can also do the configuration um, within in the classic uh, platform and make the same type of um, uh, tweaks in terms of forecasting, uh, changing the periods of forecasting and the period of length. The next enhancements that we made was to uh, coaching. Um, when coaches create an assessment manually, they're able to now add a survey to it. And if there's a coaching opportunity, uh, it will automatically trigger an assessment and include in a, uh, in a survey. So that was something, some enhancements that we made. Uh, the coaching uh, reports that were added in Classic are very similar to the ones we now have in the workspace. Uh, but this is now the, the enhancement that we made is to include it within the workforce optimization in the manager uh, workspace for both ITSM and CSM. So you can see uh, uh, visually your assessments in the past 30 days um, by the different uh, states, as well as look at the distribution of those coaching assessments by the different coaching opportunities. And then you also get a view of the top assigned skills in the past 30 days um, and how those those uh, how that those skills are coverage within your team. So what are the skill levels and how many have completed those type of uh, coaching opportunities? And then you get an average quality of uh, of coaching um, in term, and you can filter by the specific uh, assignment group to see how they perform that performance. And then there's it give, you also have the last is uh, an overdue uh, training count, uh, so you can see uh, what training. Um, our past two that you need to needs your attention and, and see which team members need to complete those trainings. And then the last enhancement we made uh, was adding in teams to uh, updating teams in our ITSM workforce optimization uh, was this overview page. Um, so where you can drill down within a specific uh, a team assignment group um, get a, a real a, a better view of what that skill um, overview is. And so, for example, if let's say the skill is SAP, you get to uh, know how many uh, users have been assigned to this uh, specific skill, um, how many are pending that still need to do the training regarding it, um, what's the coverage on your team for that skill, like a majority advanced in terms of having SAP, or is it intermediate, basic, where is there opportunity to add more training for those uh, for your teammates in order to get more experts uh, related to that um, to that skill set, and then as well as you get to know who are the experts for that skill set in that team and what the mean time to resolve uh, of incidents are related to that skill set. So work. So those that was the enhancements that we made to work optimization, there are some other enhancements that we made to our, CSC, to our CSM out of the box content. And I'm gonna go through that now. Uh, we have a new uh, dashboard in Classic, uh, which is that we rolled out in Rome. It's the Vaccine Administration Management Dashboard. Uh, this dashboard is in Classic. It's, uh, it's for the provider admin that they can use um, while they're uh, administrating the vaccines in their location. Uh, they're able to filter by day, week, and month, and they're essentially being able to view, you know, the scheduled, completed, and no-show appointments, as well filter um, by the appointments by the specific uh, vaccine center, date, method, and clinician. The method, uh, what we mean by method in this case is the terminology for the object that represents the vaccine type. Um, so it could be Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, or Moderna. And it'll describe in uh, the in terms of the value when you want to filter by the method. It'll say uh, not just the name of the vaccine type, but also show how many shots and what's the interval between those shots. So, for example, Pfizer, it would say you know two dosage and 21 days in between uh, the first and the second. 
The other uh, content that we have available for ITSM besides workforce optimization was that we updated our localization insights dashboard. Uh, we made some updates to our vendor manager uh, workspace. So the localization uh, insights dashboard, there's no net new reports to this dashboard. The only thing, the only small update that we made was we added a time step at the very top in this blue uh, ribbon um, at the top of the dashboard to let the user know when the reports have been updated. Uh, what the, this dashboard uh, provides is it provides the localization health of the system with reports that are generated from the localization insights records um, per scheduled jobs. So those are localization insights that contain like list of artifacts with their translation statuses and what, like when they were generated and it displays, uh, it'll display all that information within the dashboard. So this could be relevant for in terms of the translations that are for your service catalog items, as well as for any virtual agent topics for a particular language. For the vendor manager workspace, uh, this is not a net new uh, application. It's uh, an existing, but we made updates to it. And what this app does, it enables you to be able to monitor the performance of your company's vendors and manage all the vendor related information from one location. What the enhancement that we made in Rome is we provided an, a net new landing page uh, that will provide an aggregated view for the vendor manager. Um, it provides, uh, prior to Rome, you had to like really drill down into each vendor in order to get this type, this view uh, of aggregated metrics. Um, the, the landing page exposes all the vendors that are essentially not performing well so that it can give you an, a level of opportunity of, of uh, being able to see what, you know, do you need to change to a different vendor or, or see what specifically is going wrong. You're able to track and manage the compensation for the service agreement breaches that your vendors owe your organization, as well as uh, monitor vendor metrics and characteristics that contribute to the success of your vendors by using this landing page. And you're also able to create continue improvement initiatives um, and track those initiatives um, on your within your landing page for your vendors. Uh, you're also able to you get a view as you scroll down in that land, landing page. It provides what are the top ordered items for your vendor, as well as what are the success. I don't have it here, but what are the success uh, uh, indicators for your for your vendors? You can drill down into a specific vendor and get a view of additional metrics. And all of these are you're able to configure to look at the specific metrics that you're interested in. These are the ones that are set up by default, average customer satisfaction, SLA achievement, average availability, uh, scalability, and request activity. Um, we also made a, a tweak in um, the indicators that are in um, the vendor manager uh, score metric model. So before we had it at the monthly level and it was a monthly job collection, we now change that to a daily, uh, daily, a daily data collection. And so uh, the ones that are were previously in Quebec um, monthly, we uh, changed those. You'll see them now labeled as deprecated. And then now we have the new daily indicators that uh, match. It's the same conditions, it's just at a daily frequency. So if you're upgrading to Rome release um, from a previous release, you'll have to move those vendors that are associated with the IT service deprecated vendor score metric model and associate them with the new IT service vendor score metric model. But if you're coming straight to Rome, you won't need to do any of this. For GRC, um, for GRC, we have some net new workspace applications and we've updated our policy and compliance workspace. All of the reports that are in all of these applications are, again, they are also not net new. They're existing from our classic dashboards, but the experience that we provide in these workspace is completely new. And it, there's definitely some benefits in, in switching into this new environment. And I'll go through each of these um, briefly. I'll first start off with, um, our audit workspace. Um, our audit workspace is for the audit supervisor and for the auditor. And the net, the really cool thing, and I'll highlight this each time for our workspaces, is that 
um, it really makes it uh, beneficial in terms of only having being able to have installing one application because the workspace um, you get a centralized and a, a spe- a personalized experience for your specific personas. Uh, so this is only one app that you install, um, but depending on the roles that you have, you'll get this will be personalized for you. So if you're the audit supervisor, um, you have the responsibilities of overseeing the process of audits, making recommendations on policies and ensuring that the organization fulfills international and governmental obligations of compliance. The workspace, um, this workspace will help provide a a personalized experience, but help you manage the job better. It focuses on four main areas. It gives you an overview of the timeline of the the audit so that you can make sure that you're meeting um, your deadlines. You're also able to have a view of the tasks that are assigned to you um, and to your group and see which ones are open, unassigned, overdue. You get a a view of a summary of your audit task issues and observations um, by the different states and priorities, as well as how many open audits you have and be able to drill down to the specific open plans and engagement details. And so here's the list for the plans and engagements and if they're meeting those milestones and budgets. For the auditor, uh, they get a a different view. Uh, For the auditor, they're in charge of analyzing the operational and financial processes of a company to ensure compliance within the industry and federal regulations. So they do a lot of more busy work than the supervisor. Um, They're doing like in and out, preparing financial reports, reviewing internal controls and collecting evidence, and then conducting those audit tests and following up on those findings. So this landing page really allows them to be able to kind of follow up on, on any findings that they have that are high priority or overdue, and they also get a, a, a view of what, what tasks they still have open in for their group. They also get a view of those uh, specific, be able to track um, those audit tasks and observations and issues by priority and state. The risk workspace, um, the benefit of the workspace um, for this one is also road driven. So it's customized for the unique in each it's customized for the specific uh, user and role in the organization. And there's two uh, role personas for this work, risk workspace. Um, it's for the operational risk manager and the IT uh, risk manager. Um, for the operational risk manager, and they're responsible for managing operational risks, such as losses due to errors, breaches, damages that are caused by people, internal uh, processes, systems, or external events. Um, they can range from small or large, uh, small being maybe like a risk of loss of due to like small minor human errors or large. Um, it could be a risk of a bankruptcy due to a serious fraud event. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on this heat map um, that helps you communicate the specific risks that are threatened for your organization. It helps identify what risks uh, need more attention and you can get more detailed information from your inherent and residual risks. Um, so if you drill down further, it gives you the sc- how those scores are being calculated for those risks, as well as um, uh, you know, what, who are the specific owners and owner groups um, for the, the, the potential risks who you can be able to follow up with and what the risk a statement is and the entity. Uh, you have, uh, you're able to also look at what needs your attention. So any risks that are a high, uh, high priority, but then more further detail in terms of those that have failed specific controls or to have uh, still mitigations that are open or any issues. Um, you're also able to monitor those control tests that you have for the different uh, uh, classifications. For the IT uh, risk manager, um, they're looking specifically at any threats to their business data and critical systems. So anything related to operating, any risk that's related to operating their IT organization. And and the the workspace for them really helps them identify and assess, mitigate and monitor all the IT risk. The next workspace is the vendor risk workspace. This workspace, you're able to view and focus on the activities such as managing your vendor profile, 
assessing vendor risks and tiering, and completing the remediation life cycle. The workspace allows you to assess vendors to understand the risks they pose to your organization and reduce the manual burden and costs of association through the automation. Uh, it compresses the following. It provides you with this homepage that um, gives you um, like what are all the uh, functional components and tasks that are associated with those vendors. Um, it helps you helps users know the statuses of their tasks at hand and act on them in an organized manner. And you also get a list view of the GRC objects in that library and be able to click drill down further into what's associated with those specific uh, vendor risks. And lastly, it provides an activity summary. So you can see what's in your working queue, uh, basically gives you an overview of what those render risk, open vendor risk issues are, or tasks or assessments and then view those activities by the different states, um, by, for each of those by the different state. The privacy management workspace provides a personalized view for the privacy manager and privacy analysts. Uh, for the privacy manager, the responsibility is to develop and maintain the company policies and regulations. So this workspace really helps them do the following. They can manage and monitor the overall organizational level privacy complying posture. And what that means is compliance posture refers to the overall compliance status of an organization, business process, or business application. So whether it's compliant, fall, ends up falling, being compliant or non-compliant for the different controls that they have across their uh, reg, for, uh, across the organization for regulatory work. Um, they can design and monitor controls to deal with violations of privacy regulations. Um, they can also continuously monitor those control effectiveness and recommend uh, any improvements that need to be made. Uh, they are also able to report on the compliance posture to management and the board of directors. So it just makes it a lot easier for them to uh, share this out to the larger leadership team. And then as you drill down further, they're able to look at what are those different issues and policy exceptions by the different risk ratings and priority. For the privacy analysts, um, they can drill, uh, drill, get this view of drilling specifically to, to a processing activity, um, get where the state, where that processing activity, where it falls in that state, and get an overview of the co compliance posture for that, um, for that specific activity and what, how does it fall for the different controls. Okay, and then the, the last workspace for GRC is our policy and compliance. Uh, you're able to use this compliance workspace to manage information related to policy approvals and control objectives. Uh, you can measure the effectiveness of the company's, <clears throat> excuse me, of the company's risk management program by how quickly and completely it identifies and reacts to the risk and compliance issues. Uh, the compliance uh, score percentage is calculated from the control objective and it's also color coded by default so if it's below 50 it's in red if it falls between 50 and 80 it gets highlighted in yellow and then if it's highlight if it's anything over 80 will be highlighted in green um, the control owner or the compliance manager and the risk manager have the view of this policy compliance uh, workspace and the policy exceptions provide, uh, I'm gonna go to the next page. The privacy, the policy, um, policy exceptions provide a temporary relief for those users unable to meet the compliance requirements due to you know, extraordinary situations. For example, it could be like, if the user is unable to meet a control that stipulates that all the critical OS servers must be patched within 48 hours um, after the OS vendor releases the patch, that could be one. Uh, they also get a view of their control assurance, just the next page, of their control assurance and um, assertations. Um, the assertations are just surveys that gather evidence to, to provide that the control is, it has been implemented. Uh, the landing page uh, for Compliance Workspace provides locked in managers and users with all the information they need to manage the issues. On one single on one single page, um, and the last part that's added to the compliance uh, workspace is the issues landing page. And what this does is um, 
it allows uh, it allows you to take actionable insights and quick action on being able to filter on those specific open issues that are triaged. And this issues landing page is available on the other workspaces that I mentioned, which was the audit, privacy, and risk workspace. Moving on to our HR, um, we have one update that we made, which was to our universal request process overview uh, dashboard. Uh, this is for the process owner that leverages the dashboard to help improve their uh, universal request processes um, in turn so that they can be able to drive uh, customer satisfaction score and increase it for, for, to increase their CSAT score. Um, the updates that we made to the dashboard um, in Rome is that we added this additional tab here for our SLA trends. Uh, and it is leveraging performance analytics um, as well as reporting, but in this SLA tab, I'll skip to it, um, it leverages PA for it. Um, you're able to look at mean time to resolve by group and service, mean time to consume by group and response of SLA breaches and OLA, uh, and SLA breaches and OLA SLA breaches by group. Item. We have a couple. No, a couple. We have one update to a classic dashboard for um, our hardware asset dashboard and, and uh, platform um, for Item, and then we also have a new uh, workspace uh, called Software Asset Workspace. And again, for this one, it we migrated all the all the reporting and PA that was in uh, in our SAM dashboards um, into Workspace. So start off first with hardware asset uh, management. Our hardware asset management dashboard provides key metrics for the asset manager's hardware, consumable models, and assets for the entire asset lifecycle. The dashboard provides insights um, on assets such as procurement needs, inventory, and if end of life status. The update that we made to this dashboard is that we added this asset health tab. Um, this tab gives you an overview of hardware and consumable models that are missing any purchasing information. Undiscovered, they've been undiscovered for a period of a month, of, uh, or they've been um, they're scheduled to retire, or as well as um, they're reported maybe with uh, a lot of incidents. Um, you're able to filter the the asset health by location and the model category. Software Asset Workspace. Um, this workspace helps you manage your software licenses, compliance, and optimization. Uh, none of the, like I mentioned, none of these reports are net new, but they are, uh, they've been migrated into this workspace. Um, so it'll help you provide, provides a better centralized experience for the user. It does have multiple views, um, and I'll first go through the, uh, this one, which is the software asset overview. It's the landing page, um, it's the main landing page for the software asset workspace. And you really get to gain some insights here into what your uh, key metrics are in terms of your compliance trends, such as true of cost, potential savings, and your normalization rates. You can execute routine tasks such as running within the same, viewing these metrics, you can run a reconciliation or create uh, an entitlement. Um, you get actionable insights into your software assets via alerts and notifications. And then you're able to sort um, by product or publisher to narrow down uh, your results. So there's a filter here. The next view is your license usage. You can view the compliance status of all your publishers or view the reconciliation results, reclaim unused software or view and rerun reports from this landing page. Um, we have added um, as well is um, the PBU uh, subcapacity consumption train as well as for the RBU. Um, these were added in Rome. And uh, in order for those to appear, you do need to have the IBM license compliance software asset management app installed from the store. And what these uh, consumption trends uh, give you is an aggregated view of the peak full capacity and subcapacity of your processor value unit consumption for all your IBM products uh, within a specific time period. 
So that peak consumption uh, represents the total number of units that are required to achieve license compliance for your IBM products. The next view is within your license operations page, and it lists out the, all the entitlements and software models, um, in, import entitlement errors, and discovery models. Um, so you get a view of, of all of these by the different um, states. And then the last uh, landing page that is within this workspace is um, your software asset analytics. And it's a consolidated view of all the dashboards um, for uh, SaaS, SaaS, software as a service, optimization, engineering license, and normalization and content. So you can see uh, here, these are the different tabs. So you have a dashboard view for each of these sections. Um, the software as a service overview is a single Oracle dashboard displaying key KPIs for both pure Oracle, as well as your Microsoft Office 365 or Adobe Cloud. And for uh, when you go to the next tab, optimization and savings, uh, you get a view of metrics on how to maximize and save costs on your software assets. So it'll display license optimizations for third party publishers, such as Microsoft, Red Hat, and SAP. You get a view of what's your actual savings, uh, total spend versus potential for the top publishers. Engineering license overview. Uh, this this uh, tab will give you a view of all the engineering application license positions and their usage. So you can see the usage and use, user ratio for each of the different publishers. And you're able to filter by the specific publisher, the date, the user, and even the license server. And then the last tab within this landing page is the normalization and content. Um, and that gives you a view of the uh, normalization and content service trend charts. Um, you also get a view of what those specific tables are, uh, what their current count is and expected count. And then when they were last updated, and then when do you need to take action on them? Item. For ITOM, we updated our health log analytics dashboard. Um, what the health log, an log analytics application does is it, it predicts IT issues before they impact your users. So it'll help you solve issues faster by ingesting and analyzing and correlating um, the log data in real time. So uh, the, that app will detect a deviation for anything that has a normal pattern and it'll alert you of a possible issue. And then the dashboard essentially trends um, that historical data um, and as well as report and provides any uh, reports um, using those health log uh, data. Um, you're able to get valuable insights into the number of IT issues uh, predicted before your, before your users were affected and hoping uh, and then hope to save um, money on, uh, on those preventive uh, critical outages. Uh, so the dashboard, um, We'll track any alerts, anomalies, time required to resolve those IT incidents or other relevant information. The update that we made is um, to the dashboard is that we added this business value realization. So now you can not only get um, that insights into what those is potential issues can be, but also get the ROI metrics uh, for the app for using this application. So you get that mean time to repair, uh, what are the savings for predicting and preventing those critical outages? Um, what's the uh, savings for the MTTR? And uh, what are the number of issues being predicted? As well as uh, escalations being prevented and any incidents reduction. For ITBM, uh, we made an update to the Safe Art dashboard. What Safe Art dashboard is is the Scaled Agile Framework, and Art stands for the Agile Release Train. Uh, the dashboard lets you visualize how the art members are progressing on features and program increments over a, peri a given period. You get to gain insights on the overall velocity of the art members on their historical performance. 
specifically on these uh, PI objectives so that you, you can plan the, the work accordingly for upcoming program increments. So for Warum, we added um, program predictability uh, trend chart. Um, this is a uh, track historical, well, track historical performance uh, of the art on achieving their PI objectives. The horizontal axis um, provides shows the completed PIs and the vertical axis shows the range of the value achieved in percentage. So each of these series represents um, the business value achieved, which is calculated from the planned and actual business value of, of each of those PI objectives. And from the chart, you're able to see which teams are co uh, consistently achieving between 80 and 100% um, for their set PI objectives. Um, and the linear uh, dotted line uh, is the in the chart, it provides the linear regression on the business value achieved for art. And that series shows an indication of how those scores of the business value are achieved um, while they're trending. For platform, um, we have three different dashboards related to AI search, um, and these are net new. Um, the first one is the AI search dashboard, and it summarizes the AI search index documents, uh, configuration settings in use, and, and search query traffic. You're able to um, also uh, filter by the specific query timeframe. And uh, going back, the index uh, documents, what those are, it basically shows the number of searchable records uh, indexed by the AI search. And the documents refer, documents by index source refers to the uh, number of searchable records indexed by that specific AI search group by the index source. Dictionaries is uh, the number of synonyms and stop words um, that are being defined in that AI search. AI search profile uh, summarizes the index record counts and search query traffic associated with a specific search, pro search profile defined in the AI search. And you're able to filter uh, by a specific search profile and select the time frame of that, of that search query uh, analysis. And then the AI search analytics really uh, provides key performance metrics and trends and reports um, for that AI search usage on the main page. So its queries uh, will play will display additional information on the search queries, such as um, you're able to filter on the response time, uh, number of search users, uh, the total queries, as well as like what are some of those results, uh, the 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 click position and the self solved rate. Uh, this is for the per, per, this is for the portal analytics admin, user experience admin, or uh, the web analytics admin, as well as the viewers for each of those three different uh, experiences. They can view and monitor the search usage and performance for a specific application and date range. Um, and it just really helps them to be able to understand what the needs are for the search application in users. And then you also get the, what are the top click results and queries. For SecOps, um, we made an update to the application for vulnerability response management PA dashboard. And what that does is um, it gives the vulnerability manager the ability to uh, determine which application or determine which application vulnerable items present the most risk to the organization. So it provides a view to into their AVI activity to help them determine uh, any remediation plans and status progress that they need to make. We updated the dashboard with including two PA visualizations in the security posture tab. Um, it's the penetration testing findings and validation pending state pie chart. And these are our penetration findings in the resolve state, but with the validation pending and it's grouped by the risk rating. And then we have the pie chart for overdue penetration testing findings, which is a, a for critical penetration test findings that have missed the rated mediation target date. And it's also grouped by the risk rating. And that's it for Rome in terms of updates and new content for within PA and reporting.
Any awesome, questions? Patty. That was a great deal of information. I know a lot came out with Rome. So hopefully everyone that's on uh, is excited by, if not all of it, some, some sections of it that you did that they were hoping would come in the future. So really good information. And <clears throat> we have been answering uh, some questions as you've been talking and um, the last two that we have, um, well, here's one that came in directly about it. Uh, do you know, are there any updates to service owner workspace in Rome? Service owner workspace. Um, no, I don't think we made any updates to that one, but I'll have to confirm. I don't recall that we did. Okay. Yeah. And if and then if there are um, Brian specifically, we'll make sure that we put that into um, the event when I update this later on with the video. We'll uh, we'll make sure that we at least put a service now doc uh, to that. So that'll uh, be able to give you the information that you're looking for. So um, ham pro specifically, uh, there was a question that was asked earlier that said, are there any um, specific out of the box dashboards that come with uh, ham professional and I actually provided a link but uh, I guess it was unclear so do you know um, when when someone's using ham professional is there are there different out of the box dashboards than not no the only one we have is this this one and it doesn't include a PA right now we don't have any PA on the ham dashboard it's all reporting so if you get the the pro you would also get this the same dashboard? Uh, this is a pretty general question. I, I don't know if it's related to what you have shared, but it is how to enable out of the box dashboards. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing this specifically would be for whatever you, you decide as a customer that you're going to um, install, whether it be GRC or ham, like we were just talking about. If, if those are you know, applied to your instance, then those out of the box dashboards would be applied as well. And um, there are definitely some others on the call that if they want to speak to that a little bit more specifically, but I mean, if whatever you decide to install the, on uh, your instance, those, those dashboards would come with that. What's the actual question? How to enable out of the box dashboards. Very general. Okay, question. So, so it is a plugin that needs to be activated and that actually has to be done regardless of what um, is on your instance. So depending on the release, like everything Patty's shown you just now, unless it's available by the store, if when you upgrade to Rome, they will be in your plugin list, but they ha you have to locate them and activate the plugin. And that has to be done by a sysadmin. Um, a simple PA admin can do that themselves. So um, we're hoping that you have a good partnership relationship with your sysadmins. Um, and simply just uh, based off of everything that um, Patty shared, you can also find some of this in the docs, right, Patty? Yes. Uh, and they'll it'll they'll generally list um, the actual plugin name, and then you just need to provide that to your sysadmin and let them know yeah. you need them activated. And um, it shouldn't um, have any performance impact at all. Uh, we generally uh, don't have an Adam. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. We don't. Um, have the jobs set up to run when they're activated, you'd actually have to manually go and turn those on. So I believe there's abs right. absolutely no impact. Uh, and then a question here, no new ITSM content? Oh, no, they're, oh, net, net new? No, not in, not in room. So uh, I don't see any more questions about the content that was, um, covered. And again, we've been able to answer a few uh, as the presentation was going on. But we do have an outstanding one here that says, uh, we are using time series type PA widgets, and we have had requests to modify the show date range selector options. Our current options are three months, six months, year to date, one year and all. Is this um, feasible? And um, Adam, you and I were kind of talking about this a little bit. So I don't know if you want to take this one directly. Oh, there he is. Yeah, this this With is camp. to um, you know, um <laughs> uh, this is in the display of the the chart. I am guessing what is and and that might be John. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So the current option display. So the display and the widgets. No, you. It's not um, changeable. Um. And it, certainly not in the classic. I, I don't know if now experience we can change it, but I I'm not aware of that. Um. The date range selector. It's when when you 
when you mouse over it, those are the choices. Um, if yeah, I, I I'll just go. You can't you can't change those. Let's see, we have requests for more flexibility in modifying or more templates for the score widgets. Any plans in that space? Do I take this to the idea portal? What was I the, know with everything? What, every name, what oh, was ahead. it? I'm, could you repeat the question? Sure. We have requests for more flexibility in modifying our or more templates for the score widgets. Any plans in that space, or yeah. do I take this to the yeah. idea portal? Those visualizations are being grossly improved um, in the next couple of releases. I don't know that you wouldn't see anything um, until San Diego or Tokyo timeframe, um, but the amount of effort that's going in to make those um, really uh, above and beyond what we've been able to provide in the past, um, those efforts are being made right now. They just, it, they just that won't, you won't see them yet. But that won't be in classic, correct? That'll be in now experience. That will be in the now. Well, yeah, yeah that will be in the now. Experience. Yeah. They, uh, assume any visualization improvements are going to be in now experience in the new world and how we get there. Um, I, I am not expecting any visual cosmetic visual updates to the charts and widgets in classic. I, be, I believe you're correct. I thought I thought we had a conversation about. Yeah, I think you're right. There, there might be some that come through, but there might be some little things yeah, that kind of yeah. that kind of flourish just because of the um, right. What you will see, it, we touch it everywhere. Is, yeah, <laughs> what you will see is like um, you know better color changes. You know, so, so the things the base that are kind of universal. So like color changes, fonts, you'll be able to do some basic stuff like that, and that will follow through. That like whatever your defaults are. But uh, you know the the now experience when that's turned on in the newer releases will also make some cosmetic updates to the existing classic dashboards. But that's just like from a color schemes and that, so it'll look a little nicer, look a little more modern. Great, thanks. And then there was another. Uh, can you link me to info on how how experience is different than classic? Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to post here. We actually had an academy. Uh, session not too long ago that actually went through now experience so i'll post the link there to that where you can get some really great information on uh now experience and and how it is different than classic okay and then one more came in maybe i missed it but will we have additional target color scheme options other than percent of difference i would really like to use specific target target colors for specific values and i know that we have talked about targets, um, maybe in KB, KPI specifically type things uh, uh -huh. in Academy of Session as well. Terry, was you gonna say something? Well, all I was gonna say, hey, George, um, is that uh, we did do, a, for you specifically, George, I will send you out the recording where we talked about targets in PAC. Um, they are in the process right now of um, kind of reviewing uh, how, to get more for you out of this. So um, why don't you shoot me over this question and I will um, get that over to the right person. Awesome, thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to add parameters and if statements to reports? Um, generally what we're gonna do is dynamic filter options, um, which I know we have done a, a session on for those as well. And then as we're working on, on a dashboard, we use interactive filters. That, that's how we send the parameters. Um, and so reports don't get the parameters, the dashboard does, which sends them to the report to, to show it, but there's no interface directly on a report. You have to use the interactive filters only on the dashboard, but then in a lot of things on which rows do I want to show, um, it's about dynamic filter options. So there's, there's a lot that can be done there with scripting and what comes in and it can be, it's not the cleanest interface, but they can, um, you, you can have reports that you then put on a dashboard, which are fairly dynamic in terms of which rows they show. And then if you're trying to transform the data, that's where function fields uh, excel. Um, there are some other options as well that come through. Um, but the reports, the data has got to exist. That fundamentally, that's, that, that's key to it is that the report or the data exists in the table. You're just saying, do I want to show it or not? Um, and then the fields exist. We're not, the function fields let us do some things on the fly but we aren't doing a lot of magic to transform the data on the fly. We wanna transform the data where it is so that everything in the system, whether it's SLAs, 
or machine learning or PA or reporting all look at the same data and we don't have to transform it, transform it five different ways for five different uses. So generally, if you put it in the community, if you put in the community what you're trying to do, if you're getting stuck, somebody will help you. Um, but it depends. Lots, you have lots and lots of options to get it done, but it really depends on what use case you're trying to solve. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so we're we've run out of time. So just to close this up real quick, um, and my screen is here. So remember that former or, or previous uh, sessions are out there in the community, and this one will be out there later on uh, this afternoon. And uh, always make sure that you use the community. There's so much information that's out there. So check it out um, for questions and former sessions and all other types of information that is out there as well. Uh, of course, there's always now learning. So make sure that you're utilizing the information that's there in now learning. And there are some uh, still some uh, labs that are out there. So take advantage of those while they are out there as well. Uh, other sessions, sessions you might be interested in are platform foundations, mobile app and virtual agent. Uh, and the links here are provided. So check those out as well for great information there. Uh, the next session, which will be on October 6th, will actually be on what's new in Rome as well. It'll talk about uh, features. So it'll be another great one uh, with a lot of uh, great content as well. And then of course, always, uh, if you have any questions or curious about how to write really great questions, here's the link to the article that's out there that can help you with that. And uh, this just kind of covers everything that I just did. So. Thank you again for joining. Thank you, Patty, for all the great information that you provided. Uh, and thank you to everyone that's one that has answered questions, Dan, Tara, Adam. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you very much.